Hi everybody, this is Matthew Pose with Pose Acoustics. Um, in this video, I'm gonna talk about something that's actually come up in my own theater design. Um, you'll probably see it discussed in another video. It's something that everybody faces and uh, it's a topic that I think is, I've covered it a little bit before, but I wanna like really focus just on that to kind of explain the different ways it plays out. So I've mentioned before that one reason why I like baffle walls, especially those that actually do extend properly from the boundaries of the room. So left to right wall, floor to ceiling is that the speakers that are out in a room have a sound, the sound wave at low frequencies is omnidirectional. It goes everywhere. So one of the things that happens is that that means the sound does go from the front of the speaker to the back, well, behind the speaker, but that's the front wall. So it goes back behind the speaker, hits the front wall and comes back. And when it does that, the sound wave now is off in phase by the path link difference from the sound emanating from the front of the speaker and that bounce basically from the front wall back again. When the sound waves you know, hit each other, they combine. They're now not in phase with each other, and so you'll get peaks and dips that are formed from this. This is sometimes referred to as the Allison dip. I call it um, SBIR, or speaker boundary interference response. It actually happens from all the walls in the room, the floor, the ceiling, the front wall, the back wall, and the side walls. It's just that the front wall one, because it's so close, the, and the amplitude is gonna be so high, relative to the direct sound, that the interference effect tends to be the greatest. So floor bounce, ceiling bounce, and front wall reflections, or bounds if you wanna call that too, are the most significant SBIR effects that you'll see in a system. All of this is easily calculated. It's simple quarter wave rules. Um, and there are calculators online you can use. Most of them are in metric and are put out by groups in Europe. But that's, it's not that hard to convert centimeters to inches if you need to. So if you place a speaker in a boundary, then you can't have a bounce off that boundary that causes interference because the bounce is exactly the same in time as the direct sound. So when you place a speaker in a wall, there's no longer an inter interference response from that wall. Now there's still gonna be a floor response, a ceiling response effect and side, but like I said, that front wall is one of the most significant ones. You can actually get rid of the floor and ceiling ones too by doing something similar. So when you place a speaker on the floor, a mirror is created and you get a response that's equal to the speaker's response at the speaker as if there's another speaker underneath it, basically below the floor. That's the mirror effect that you see. Same if you were to put it on the side wall, you know, if you just placed a speaker that was like a normal bookshelf and you put it sideways against the wall, so it still kind of points down the length of the wall, but it's up against it, you'd have a mirror. Even if you angled it, there's still gonna be a mirror. And so if you take a speaker and you extend the speaker's radiation from floor to ceiling, like you can get with a line array, there's no longer going to be a floor and ceiling bounce effect. So that's another thing that people have sometimes designed in. The issue there, because that may seem like an obvious solution that everybody should do, is that the speaker really needs to be a good speaker and not just a line array. There's other ways to address this, so it requires a lot of woofers, for instance, because the center to center distance needs to maintain properly to, to, to get a proper line array out of that. So it's not like you can just do, let's say like three 12 inch drivers spaced out and you get the effect. You really in like a 10 foot room would probably need eight of them uh, to be able to make that work. And that's just floor to ceiling. You still have to do wall to wall too to get rid of that effect. So one of the easier solutions is actually to use things like beam forming, which can be done passively or actively. And that's actually part, beamforming is a part of the way the new Trinoff tech works. So in some ways using DSP and a smaller number, but still large number of subwoofers is probably a better way to get rid of that problem. So, okay, back to SPIR, it's a common issue, kind of hard to get rid of um, when you've got speakers spaced away from the wall, you put them in the wall, it, get, you know, it does get rid of it. So what happens when you've got box speakers is that they almost always have to get pulled out into the room. The farther they are from the front wall, the lower in frequency that that peak and dip is gonna be formed. And it's the dips that are really the most annoying to deal with. The peaks you can EQ out, the dips you can't. And so one of the things is that we typically pull speakers pretty far out because at some point it actually gets to be low enough that subwoofers out in the room can kind of comp compensate basically for that issue. 
Um, it also, we, a lot of people have subjectively found or qualitatively found, whatever you want to say, that from their experience, that speakers pull out into a room seem to image better. You get better layering, it sounds better. I've never found any research to support this. I don't know that it's necessarily true or not, but it's definitely an anecdote you hear a lot. And it's even one that I've fallen prey to, meaning that it seems to be consistent with my own experiences. On the other hand, I've not heard a lot of really, really good in-walls until I got the ProListens. Those are by far the best in-walls I've ever heard. And I think they image really well. I would probably have to get the S7T towers in, which I've talked about doing but haven't actually done yet, and actually listen to the S7Ts next to the in-walls, A, B, back and forth, and hear if there's really a difference in imaging. There might be, I don't know. So in any case, back to what I was talking about, you get these SBIR effects. And one of the reasons why we like to do a lot of low frequency absorption on the front wall is that by putting low frequency absorption on the front wall, you absorb a lot of that reflection and it reduces the problem. One of the issues is that if you pull the speaker too far out, it's so low in frequency that you'd have to have really serious absorption on the front wall to be effective. So one of the things we'll do in home theater designs is actually push the speaker right up against the wall um, or pretty darn close to that for an, like an on-wall speaker basically. And then that keeps the distance between the drivers and the front wall low enough that we can use a normal, let's say six inch absorber and, and take care of all the problem. Um, so in my own theater, I ended up making a compromise. It was just a change of plans, ended up making something I did not useful anymore and actually caused a problem but I was stuck with it, and that was that the screen wall is not wall to wall, it couldn't be because of a door, and it sticks out about 14 inches from the wall in total once everything was kind of put on it. The speakers themselves are not 14 inches from the wall, the speakers themselves are 12 inches from the wall because there is two to two and a half inches of insulation that I'm including in that 14 inch measurement. Um, and that is the actual radiation point for the bounce off the wall. And that ended up leading to a small dip in the response, which I was worried might happen, but it was actually less than I expected. Part of that being that there is a lot of absorption on the screen wall itself, but there was none on the side portions around the screen wall of that front wall, which is really where the dip was forming. Um, I haven't added all the insulation, so there's an area above and below the, uh, where the screen wall area is right now that's gonna get filled with insulation, that probably will help it, but I actually found just sticking six inch base absorbers on the side areas seem to help that dip a lot. And that's essentially consistent with how we design, and the reason I'm telling you this is not to tell you what I did, but actually to tell you the kinds of things we do to address this, which is that, you know, if you've got on-wall speakers, you do need some absorption to deal with the sound that's radiating across that wall that can end up causing some interference and comb filtering. Um, there's also sound that reflects off of the screen and back. That causes comb filtering too. But with on-wall speakers or in-room speakers, you're also going to have these SPIR effects. And they actually can be much more significant and, and cause more problems with sound. Um, where you place yourself and how you place the subwoofers often has no effect because typically these, are op these problems are above the area where the subwoofers operate. And... Um, their SBIR effects don't change with position of you, they only change with position of the speaker. So adding absorption on that wall, because the reflections off the front wall are not particularly useful. They don't help with imaging. You know, They're not something that pr provides this sense of presence or a sense of spaciousness or envelopment or any of that. They don't affect apparent source width. They're actually kind of useless. And especially at low frequencies, mostly just cause problems. So absorbing below, let's say 500 hertz, most of what hits that wall isn't such a bad idea. And that's why we tend to put a lot of absorption up on that front wall and don't really need to put a lot of diffusion. The only reason you'll see us sometimes use things like slap panels or other things that kind of give you a mix of absorption and, and reflection is because the one thing you don't want to do in a room is concentrate all of the absorption that you need to get your RT60 down in one space. And so if you cover the whole front of the room in absorptive material and you end up getting the RT60 down to let's say 0.35 seconds, which is roughly where you'd want it in a typical room, um, before you've even put in any absorption anywhere else in the room, one of the problems is now you've concentrated all the absorption you needed for the RT60 in one location and that's not really where you wanted it. You really want to have a more even mix throughout the room. And so one thing we'll do to address this is we'll use things like filtered panels, which basically only absorb at low frequencies. They have things like, uh, like a special layer on the front, um, like a piece of uh, vinyl or something like that, that helps to absorb at low frequencies, actually increases low frequency absorption, but reduces high frequency absorption. 
we'll use perf panels. It's another way of doing it. All of this helps to keep the room from getting too dry at one location, basically. Um, but that is still an important area, as I said, for absorption. And I'm not as concerned. I don't really worry too much about the low frequencies being overly absorbed. There is an argument I've made it before. I think it's worth understanding its existence that overabsorbing reflections at low frequencies could cause the sort of anechoic base effect that isn't necessarily desirable. But realistically, it's the sidewall reflections that you want. The front and back ones, which are monophonic, are not particularly useful. And so absorbing those really heavily, I don't think is that big a deal. It's very, very rare that a room would actually have that much low frequency absorption that it would be too low. And so in a lot of rooms, you actually need to add some low frequency absorption. And I don't think it's so bad to do a lot of it on the front and rear wall like that. Um, so, you know, those are areas where I tend to put a lot of absorption. And the front wall, the rear reflections, diffusion of the reflections, things like that is, is a good idea on the rear wall. The front wall, it's not as valuable. So the front, what you'll see for me is that it's gonna be typically either slap panels, perf panels, or just normal, but like I said, low frequency filtered absorption panels. That's just what I typically do in the front wall. I don't really do anything else. I don't find it all that useful. Side walls, pretty even mix of absorption and diffusion. Back wall, same thing. I do like to have usually low frequency absorber kind of like dead center of the rear wall. Um, it's, uh, you know, sometimes you just do things and it seems like a good idea and it seems to have worked and so you do it. I don't know that I can point to exact theories for this because at low frequencies you've got something that's sort of operating as if it's a planar wave. I mean, by the time the, a sound wave at below 100 hertz hits the rear wall, it's a, it's a, have a, it would have expanded so much that it's essentially planar. So, you know, probably an even mix is still a better idea. Uh, than trying to concentrate it. But I typically put mostly absorption on the center and on the corners, and then I try to do diffusion and, and scattering in the in-between area between the center and the, and the corners. Um, this all helps with SBIR, but it also helps to maintain that good spaciousness. So I'll try to add in here some little clips so that you can see as well about how when you move the speaker uh, forward and back of that wall, what happens to SBIR. And I'll make sure that in this little simulation, I'm gonna use REW for this because it's an easy thing to do. I'll make all the other surface, surfaces very absorbative so you're only seeing the contribution of that one wall on SBIR. So hopefully this is helpful and helps give you some ideas of how to treat your own room um, when you're doing your projects. Uh, Subscribe to my channel and you'll get more of this interesting stuff. Thanks.